How many of you ever heard of the word rumspringa? Anybody heard that word, rumspringa? Uh, there's probably not too many Amish people in here with us today, so you probably may not be familiar with it. But rumspringa actually means running around. It's actually a word that describes an Amish practice that teens between the ages of 14 and 16 um, are given a free pass. They're allowed to go out into the free world and do whatever they want. They're to go out and to experience the world. It's their kind of time of, do I want to come back and commit to the Amish way of life and, and be baptized into the Amish faith and, and practice of being Amish? Or do I want to turn my back on the people that I call family and do my own thing? And so they each get to go out and just experience the world. Um, we kind of have that today, but we just don't call it rum spring. We may call it maybe a freshman year um, or maybe spring break. That's um, probably a, a good, um, but here's a good one. I, I think this, uh, maybe it might be midlife crisis resulting in buying a Harley without asking my wife springa. Um, I mean, it could be something like that. Uh, perhaps some of us are in that rum springer right now. We're kind of wandering around, experimenting here and there with, with life, trying to find purpose, trying to find meaning. So we're in this second week of the series titled, Finding Your Way Back to God. And really, that's what the church is all about, is really bringing people and helping people find their way back to God. That's the whole, really, purpose of the church. But many of us have already experienced that first time of really kind of finding our way back to God and, and, and giving our lives to God. But really, finding your way back to God is more than just a one-time experience. It's really a lifetime journey that we take. It's really a lifetime of growing and processing and, and experiencing life and kind of figuring out what do we do with the things that we face. Finding your way back to God is a life-changing moment, but it's also a life-growing process. There are five awakenings that we're focusing on in this series. And this last Sunday, uh, we looked at the first one. My computer decided to not work. There we go. The, we looked at the first one. Uh, technology doesn't like me today for some reason. It is awakening to longing. It is it coming to this place where we realize that we all have these universal longings in our life that we long for love and purpose and meaning. And these are really God-given longings. These are longings that were given to us by God, but the problem is a lot of times we wander away from God in order to find love, in order to find meaning and purpose in our life. But we have it all standing right in front of us from the very beginning. We begin to chase stuff that we think that will satisfy those longings in our life, whether it's a, a successful career, whether it's money in the bank account, whether it's you know, a certain individual, or we look for in relationships and friendships. But sometimes we end up making the wrong decisions. We find ourselves in a place that we never really expected to be, and then we come to what is the second awakening. This place where we may be saying, how did I get here? I wish I could start over. Which brings us to our second awakening, the awakening to regret. The awakening to finding something missing in our life and realizing I made a mistake along the way. At some place in your life you may wish you could have started over. Wouldn't it be great if we could just have a do-over 
um, you know, on the golf course, I get to at least to have one mulligan where I get to hit the ball over again, even though I need one like every stroke. But, you know, you get at least one. Why can't God give us one do-over? Well, really, he does. But the thing is, we will never get to that place of realizing that God gives us grace if we don't actually come to a place where we realize that we regret. Because if you never have regret in your life, if you never regret the decisions you made, you'll never see a reason to turn back to God. And so we pick up in our story. Just a few minutes ago, you saw the video that was of the, some people reading of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. And they shared the story of Jesus where he tells the story of the prodigal son. What I want to focus on today is a segment of this passage, verses 17 and 18. It says, when he came to his senses, he said... How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And in this passage, there's two important segments that I want to focus on this morning. The first one is when he says that he came to his senses. And then a little later, the second part is I will go, I will set out and go back to my father. When he came to his senses, the son was really ex experiencing that second awakening where he had regrets, where he had the regret of going to his father and asking him for his inheritance. And, and in that time, literally saying, dad, I don't care if you're alive or not. I want what's coming to me and I want it now. And so he takes his money and he goes and it says that he squanders it. He wastes it on wild living. And kind of leaves us to imagine what that wild living could possibly be. But I think we all have a good idea of what that really is. That first awakening that he had was where he was literally longing for something more. Which is why he left his father. So the son sets out to a distant land and he attempts to find that something more. He attempts to find and search for that thing that would satisfy that love, that desire for meaning and purpose. But he doesn't find it. What he finds is regret. What he finds is that he has to come to his senses. He has to make a decision that realizing that he made a mistake. Have you ever been there? Have you ever found yourself at the, the trail end of a bad decision? I, I know I have. Unfortunately, I think I've been there too many times. But unfortunately, I can say that I'm human, so I'll probably find myself at the end of another one. And you see, that's the point where this is a life-going process. It doesn't something that just happens once. But we grow. We learn from our mistakes. I'm learning a lot faster that once I've made a mistake and I realize it, to turn back to God a lot sooner in the process than I would have at the beginning of this process. Sometimes we're just going the wrong way. And despite our family, despite friends maybe coming into our life and speaking into our life and, and really telling us, hey, you're making wrong decisions. You're going to regret this. You don't want to go down this road. You don't want to date this person. You don't want to buy that house. You, you can't financially afford that car. But yet we still find ourselves going in the wrong direction. Maybe you can relate to this clip. Wants to race. Oh, race? That's ridiculous. Oh, 
right, come on, let's go, let's go. Put your window down! You want something? Uh, he's probably drunk. You're going the wrong way! What? You're going the wrong way! He said we're going the wrong way. Oh, he's drunk. How would he know where we're going? Yeah, how would he know? Thank you, thanks a lot. Terrific. Thank you! <laughs> what a moron. Maybe you find yourself being able to relate with these two jokers. Because we're, maybe we're going the wrong way in life. But the best thing, the best decision we can make is to wake up. Is to wake up and listen to the people speaking into our life. Is, is to listen that I messed up. I made the wrong decision. Sometimes that's the hardest thing to admit, but it's the best thing for us. And it's really the first place where we begin to find hope. We begin to find a, a new beginning. Listen to this guy. Uh, I grew up in a, a Christian home um, with two parents who also grew up in in Christian families. When I was young, about seven, my, my parents moved to a camp in Central Illinois, a Christian youth camp. And that was a really, really cool way to grow up, uh, just surrounded by youth groups and, and Christian kids. And coupled with that, I also grew up in the church, surrounded by a family that uh, didn't just believe it, but they lived it. You know, I had a faith. I saw how it had played out in my family's lives, but I did not have a direction and I did not have a purpose that I felt like I was being pulled towards or, or called to, just kind of searching, longing for a fulfillment that it seemed like everybody else in my family had. After, you know, searching from school to church, um, you know, the slopes of Colorado, I think I finally came down to, well, I want to pursue music in some sort, and I had a cousin in Nashville, and, I finally just said, all right, let's go, let's try it. And then I moved down to Nashville, just hoping to find music or write or play, or yeah, I wasn't really sure. Um, and just started bartending and waiting tables. Alongside that was, was just a, a life of partying, of pleasure, I mean, just fun. Uh, it was great, I'm not gonna lie, it was a blast. I had a lot of fun, but it's also very unhealthy. It just became continual, just meeting girls and, and drinking. By five years in, I had moments where I laughed at myself and knew, fools do this, you are living like a fool. Probably a year and a half after that, six and a half years in, uh, by that point, it was serious. It was drinking every day as soon as I get up uh, because I would have a horrible hangover. And I was starting to think, this is gonna be rough, making it change at this point. Coming to our senses and acknowledging that our decisions have taken us in the wrong places, 
that we have really couldn't even imagine that we've been. Richard Rohr says it this way, you cannot heal what you do not acknowledge. And what you do not consciously acknowledge will remain in control of you from within, festering and destroying you and those around you. If you do not acknowledge, many of us know this all too well. Uh, maybe we wake up and call, maybe a wake up call is what many of us need today. Maybe today, many of us need to finish and put an end to our rum springer. You know, the second piece that we, that we see that this son, he not only came to his, descent, came to his senses, but he acted on it. He, he came to his senses and he put it into action. Maybe you've heard of this word, what we like to call repentance. But you see, we only like to talk about the first part of, of this word, to repent, because we connect it with our eternal destiny and, and we just think it's this way to, to get to heaven. But it's coming to our senses and realizing that we re need repentance, but it's also realizing that there has to be an action to it. The, the two words that we find, uh, metanoia is the Greek word for repentance and, and teshuva is the, the Hebrew word for repentance. Metanoia, the Greek word, means to repent. It's what we find in the New Testament. Teshuvah is what we find in the Old Testament. But here's the biggest difference between the two. Metanoia means changing one's mind. But teshuva means to return. See, there's two parts to repentance. Repentance. There's the part where we change our mind, we make the decision, we decide in our mind that we made a mistake, that we messed up, but the second part of that is to return back to our Creator, to return back to God. So we see that there's two parts to this going on. My guess is a lot of us have done really well at the first part. We realize that we've made mistakes. We realize that, that we need to turn back to God. But we don't. We don't do the second part. What we really have done is we've created this cycle. We have this cycle that we get in, which is the first two awakenings. We have this longing for something more, for love and meaning and purpose, but then we go down the wrong road looking for those things, and now we find ourselves having regret. But instead of returning back to God, we just continue the cycle over again. Longing, regret. Longing and regret. For many people, we have to draw that line in the sand saying that this is who I am. This is who I am and I need to return back to God. For some of you, we call that drawing the line in the sand it is baptism. Which coming up October 11th, you will have that opportunity. If, if you believe that you're ready if you believe that this is a time in your life where you say, you know, God, I'm, I'm tired of, of living the wrong way. I'm tired of making the wrong decisions. And I know I need to return to you. You know, baptism isn't, it doesn't mean that you have everything figured out and you know all the answers. You won't. Your whole life, you won't have all the answers. It doesn't mean that you won't wander away again. But it means you're serious about God. And you realize that God is who you need in your life. And that God is the person who fulfills those longings that you have. Last week we introduced you to the Pascal's wager. 30 days of, of that wager of, of having, um, praying these prayers really. Because Pascal was a very an intellectual person, very smart person, and he made this wager to his fellow intellects. If God is real, then pray that he will make his presence, make who he is real to you. 
Because here's the bet, here's the wager. If, if God doesn't exist, you've lost nothing. But if God does exist, then you've gained everything. So it's, it's a perfect bet, take it. And so he offered this bet to his fellow intellects. And, and we offered that to you, that wager to you, to, to take that wager so we prayed a prayer and we pray a new one today it says God if you're real awaken in me sorry God if you are real make yourself real to me awaken in me the possibility that with you I can start over again with you, I can start over again. Listen to Jake's end of his story. I was pretty functional, uh, considering. Went to work and maintained this I party every night kind of attitude. And I partied openly every night so that when people would smell down me the next day, it was normal because, well, guy parties every night. I was at my sister-in-law's house, uh, checking on their house. They were in South America uh, for his work. And I was drinking, and I just had this totally normal moment of going, this has to stop. Like, I, I, I have to stop. I, I will die at some point from this if I don't. And I couldn't stop that night because I had to work the next three days and I knew it's gonna be ugly and I won't, I won't be able to work. I knew after Wednesday night at work, I would have four days off in a row. So I prayed to God that night. I said, God, I need to stop drinking on Wednesday. <laughs> so please keep me safe for the next three days. So that night, Wednesday night, I went back to my sister and brother-in-law's and took my last drink and went to bed. And I would say I woke up four or five in the morning with immediate DTs. This was not a, a day later, this was hours. And I mean, I couldn't see straight, kind of hyperventilating. I'd had one before, so I knew exactly what it was. I'd had the doctor explain it to me. So that started Thursday morning, really early before the sun came up, and that just went all day, all night. Friday, all day, all night, and I should have you know, been with a doctor, nurse, been at a rehab center, something, just to make sure I was okay. But uh, as I was laying there, I just kept remembering this prayer from a book about a Celtic monk that I loved growing up. My dad introduced me to the author. The prayer that he goes to anytime he doesn't know what to do is, Lord have mercy. And it's just, he repeats it, it just becomes this meditation, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. And that's what I did from, from Thursday morning till Saturday. Knowing the whole time and kind of laughing at myself that like I really don't deserve this, this mercy, this grace, but asking anyway and receiving it. Saturday morning, I think the last DT was around 11 o'clock. And I got up and I started drinking water and started keeping water down. And Saturday night, I finally slept. Just fell asleep, crashed out, and got up the next day and went to church. That was pretty much my first response. Talked to the campus pastor that Sunday morning and said, this is where I'm at, uh, what, what can I do? Who can I talk to? How can I get connected? The reality is we don't have to live in this cycle of longing and regret. That we have a God who, who loves us and who is willing to open his arms to you no matter what, you have a way out. You have a second chance. You have a third, a fourth. You have endless amount of, of chances with God. He doesn't put a limit. You see, the prodigal story really is our story. I challenge you sometime to read this story and put your name in there. Put your name in the place of the son that, that left. 
because it really is our story. Jeff and I are going to I'm going to narrate kind of a story and he's going to play a song. The story is from the retelling of uh, an author of Philip Yancey. Uh, the song is called Coming Home. But today could be your day. Today could be the day that you come to your senses and come home. It says her name was Christina, or Krista. And she grew up in a small cherry farm in Traverse City, Michigan. She was a wild child who dismissed her parents as old-fashioned because of how they responded to her piercings and tattoos. One night, Krista and her parents had a huge fight. At the end of it, she slammed the door and said, I hate you. Then acted on a plan she had been rehearsing for months in her mind. And she ran away to the big city of Detroit. Within hours of arriving in Detroit, she met a man who seemed warm and nice. He drove the most expensive car she had ever seen, and he was willing to take her in. This nice man taught her a few things that would make her valuable on the streets. And because Krista was young, she brought in top dollar for her services. As time went on and as she got a little older, she wasn't bringing in top dollar anymore. And so she was thrown out on the street with no money and a drug habit to support. And the blood will dry underneath my nails and the wind will rise up to fill my sails so you can doubt and you can hate but I know no matter what it takes I'm coming home coming home tell the world I'm coming home let the rain wash away all the pain of yesterday I know my kingdom awaits may forgiven my mistakes I'm coming home I'm coming home tell the world I'm coming One night, she thought back to those sunny spring days when she would be lying beneath the cherry trees, realizing that renting her body on the streets of Detroit was no way to live. She decided she would head north, maybe move to Canada, and start over. On her way north, she figured she'd try something that she thought um, had no chance of actually working. She mustered up enough courage to give her parents a call. No one answered, but she left a message telling them she was going to be passing through Traverse City on her way to Canada. If they wanted to see her, she would be at the bus station around midnight. After hanging up, she thought leaving the message was a stupid thing to do because odds were they were happier now that she was gone. As the bus headed north, she could see the signs saying the bus was getting closer to Traverse City. She ran through the possible scenarios in her mind. Nobody there to meet her. Somebody there, but really only to shame and condemn her. Finally, the bus arrived in Traverse City. And she heard the bus driver say, 15 minutes at this stop. 15 minutes. far away from where I belong but it's always darkest before the dawn so you can doubt you can hate but I know no matter what it Coming home, I'm coming home. Tell the world I'm coming home. Let the rain wash away all the pain of yesterday. 
yesterday I know my kingdom awaits And they've forgiven my mistakes I'm coming home, I'm coming home Tell the world I'm coming All her mental rehearsing didn't prepare her for what she found when she stepped off the bus. At midnight in this small bus depot, she found dozens of familiar faces belonging to her aunts, her uncles and cousins and grandparents, all wearing silly party hats. A huge banner hanging from the wall said, Welcome home, Krista. Her dad broke through the crowd and ran up to her. And as she tried to explain herself, he wrapped his arms around her, making it clear that all he really cared about was that his daughter was home. Coming home, I'm coming home. Tell the world I'm coming home. Let the rain wash away. All the pain of yesterday I know my kingdom awaits They've forgiven my mistakes I'm coming home, I'm coming home Tell the world I'm coming home Today you find yourself being overwhelmed with regret. Today's the day you need to come to your senses. Today's the day you need to return home. Today's the day where you need to begin the journey. Because here's the good news. God's there. God is, is there waiting he, he's not waiting on anything. He's just standing there looking out to the east, just waiting for you to come home. He doesn't care about the things that you did when you were gone. He doesn't care about the, the time that you wasted apart from him. He cares about one thing, that you're home. So I just want to ask you today, if you have regrets, good. Do something with them. Don't just regret the decision you made. Put action behind that regret. And turn away from it. Because there's a reason that you regret it. There's a reason that you see in your life that it was a bad decision. It was something that took me away from God because that longing still is not met. That longing is still there for love and purpose and meaning. God says, I don't care about that. What I care about is you being with me. So I pray that no matter where you find yourself on your journey, that you'll come home. That you'll come home to God. Just one more time. Stand with us. Jesus, I, I pray that across this room that no matter the regrets that we find ourselves having in this place, I pray that no one will leave this place not knowing, not understanding that you have forgiven them. That you're just waiting there with your arms spread, just praying for that moment that your child, that your son, that your daughter would come home. Jesus, I thank you for being there for me. I pray that each one of us would be able to experience that love 
that despite our mistakes, that we would know that you don't care, that you care more about one thing, and that is our relationship with you. God, help us to make a decision to return home today. 